Okay, hi. Um, I'm here uh, with uh, Caleb Lindsay, Simone Lee, and Jacoby Satterwhite, and um, we're here to talk about their work and the um, show Radical Presence, uh, Black Performance in Contemporary Art. I have a couple questions, and I'd like to start out with um, uh, just asking each of you for your own personal definition of performance as it applies to your own work. When do you look at an aspect of your work and think that is performance? I guess I'm aware. Um, I try not to call it anything, I mean, because it's such a process-based practice, but my body is an essential pivot for everything, so I think um, the process alone is very performative, whether it's tracing with a digi with digital pad or performing in the green screen or performing um, in public. Uh, it all roots back to what my body's doing and what it's around and how it's being influenced by um, my surroundings or my materials. So I think all the time, but I'm kind of like a very open-ended kind of thinker. And um, I call painters performance artists. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, because it's all about your identity, whether you're female or male or black person, it, it's rooted in that. So. It's always performance for me. Okay. How about for you, Kayla, for Simone? Is it always performance, or are there particular moments that you say that is the performative moment? I'm um, for me. I always, I mean, I always see my body of work as, <laughs> as performance. If it's from from writing the music, performing the music, you know, everything from the collages and that sort of thing. I I know everything and we doing life can be considered a performance, but I tend to make a separation often where people, where most performance art does kind of filter, of how people present it, it filters into like their real life or they cross that boundary. But I do prefer mine to be contained in terms of being on stage or on the screen. Um, I w in school, I wasn't always comfortable with improvising because I always wanted to edit mm -hmm. my dialogue and my script. So I do consciously sometimes decide <laughs> what I want to um, present in a theatrical form, if that's on video or on stage. But I do know some people question if it's acting <laughs> or performance or not because of how I like to present it, but that's just my particular choice. What aspect of it is it causes people to question that it's performance, that it's on screen or? Well, I think because I, you know, like Jacoby or Marina or somebody who does their performances sometimes, where some of her stuff have been in the stage setting. Mm -hmm. But you know, you go into a, maybe a town, then you just start performing open ended, sure. like, or you do some type of endurance thing, like, I don't know if I'll do that in the future, but that's just not mm -hmm. how I choose to present it. I'd rather have people come sit down, watch, and listen mm -hmm. if it's live or on video. Okay. How about you? Um, well, I primarily make sculpture, and I think that um, there's a lot of uh, objects or residue or artifacts of performance that people will present as sculpture, but I actually am interested in more how performance relates to sculpture. So it's mm -hmm. like I come at it from a different direction. And there's also a lot of um, performativity in the method of making the object that I'm interested in. Um, so I would see that those are like two of my points of view, but with the videos and the collaborations that I've done, um, I would say um, that, well, it's hard to talk about in general. I would have to talk about the specific works. Um, but they sort of talk about performativity in the black, his in the black body in history mm -hmm. um, as it relates to women's work or slavery or the masquerade or voodoo or 60s feminism. So there's a lot of different things that I'm interested in that I can sort of, 
I became interested in performance because it was a way for me to access those histories more mm -hmm. obviously than I do when I'm working in sculpture. I mean, just to follow up on that, um, when we think about that history of um, uh, say African American and African diaspora cultural practices, the object is is um, uh, integral to various ritual and uh, theatrical and musical um, uh, scenarios. Um, do you find yourself drawing upon that kind of connection between the sculptural or the object-based and the performative in your work? I do. Um, I'm, I'm working on a project right now that involves the Beiji dolls, and at one point they were the sort of carved, they're sort of normally carved by um, um, an artist or a um, spiritual person for a family when a twin dies and at some point they became replaced with a plastic doll um, and so a lot of times when I'm thinking about sculpture I'll think about things like that how a belief system is transferred from one object to the other um, and so <clears throat> sort of extending from that it sort of becomes um, you know, that object and how it's like treated, like especially a baby dolls will be like cared for and taken care of. Um, and there's all these gestures associated with that kind of domestic mm -hmm. practice of like caring. And then that sort of blurs into ideas of women's work. And so these are the ways in which I get involved. Mm -hmm. Even when I'm doing sculpture, I get sort of drugged back into the conversation in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so that the, the, um, the object produces a kind of uh, social sculpture around its... Yeah, um, its very existence. Yeah, its very existence. Um, the um, kind of picking up on that relation between um, uh, uh, either memorial practices or, um, or, or spiritual practices and the art and, 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 and uh, the object, I wanted to ask each of you whether or not um, you're making something that you consider to be performative and it sounds like in various ways there's performance in the work. Um, how you see your work as relating m to what people would recognize as the performing arts, like music, uh, dance, uh, theater? Um, is there, um, can you talk about that intersection and how that affects your work as someone working in uh, contemporary art? Yeah, I, um, I think for me, in terms of the music part, like, I just grew up naturally, like, around a family of singers. So I grew up in the church. And so I was doing theater and chorus and that sort of mm -hmm. thing and playing the piano in church. But I actually stopped. Like when I went off to college, I stopped for like years and years. And then I started doing a student project and then I sort of started again, like recording with my cousins. And mm -hmm. then that project kind of fell apart. And so then I stopped again. And so when I started creating all my children, characters. I created Taiwan and so that's actually when I started playing the piano and performing again. Mm -hmm. um, I think I did a performance here. I did one at MoMA PS1 and so that's sort of what got me back into mm -hmm. the music part and then my friends suggesting that you know I do an album or do record some of the songs and so the performance arts actually pulled me back mm -hmm. into the performing. Um, I do think it can confuse some people, but for me, I in, I intentionally made the decision when I did photo shoots to always dress up as a character or persona mm -hmm. early on and not as myself. Um, as I've said, I kind of find myself, if I didn't, then I would be, you know, like other singers, um, mm -hmm. which I have no problem with that because I listen to them, but I thought as to, in terms of like dealing with identity to kind of put Mm -hmm. All these in, in the continue to explore that it seemed, you know. I chose to do do the dressing up thing. Um, mm -hmm. I try to also producing a mask as well as an identity, right? You're creating a role. Is that what you're? I'm so I'm sorry. To? It's it's sort of like I'm creating I'm creating the roles, but sometimes the emotion is coming from a real place. Mm -hmm. But they do get tweaked in terms of story because I took screen <laughs> screenwriting, so mm -hmm. a lot of that. Mm -hmm kind of goes into it. It's not that it's so contrived, because the original emotion is raw, but after that it does get filtered. I don't want to say box, because I always complain about being stuck in a box, but it does become some sort of craftsmanship on some level. 
Um, I I just joined the uh, the Grammys Academy, and so they called me up, and then they actually told me they were confused <laughs> about what I actually do because it's like the music, and then they see the personas and the different characters, and I told them I'm a performance artist, you know, and the music drives a lot of the work and so I had to send them links to my different videos for them to approve my membership so sometimes it does the boundary get, blurring it, makes it gets people confused, makes it confusing, yeah because not everybody are so aware and like so it's so. almost like to go back to that first thing you said about being a child and the singing and uh participating in the everyday drama of black life, right? uh, as Zora Neale Hurston puts it, um, that all these disciplines, arts, are kind of intermingled, right? There isn't a, there isn't a division <coughs> that then there comes to be kind of an in, in, in adult, uh, I think adult it, life. I, I think it becomes a, a division sometimes in the different systems. Sure. And I think within the different systems, they do, there are some subtleties in the way it's approached. I think because with performance art, we tend to present things in a way where it is a questioning or an examining where like some musicians they're not even thinking about that they're just like you know just living it or just doing it and just being in it and so I think because most performance artists do have some distance or most fine artists or visual artists have some distance to create the picture but a lot of times when you're singing I know sometimes I do going to a space where I'm just in that and I'm not here. So I think some, so I think that's a lot of times where the art world mm -hmm. in itself is coming from, where we, we step back and... In terms of this like self-consciousness versus immersion in, in performance, um, uh, do you, uh, do either you, Simone or, or Jacoby, feel that in relation to um, a, a piece of work that you've made? Um, this this sense that um, uh, that Caleb's pointing to, I think of like kind of wearing a mask or maybe discarding it and becoming fully uh, immersed in the moment as the role you're playing. Like, could you? I know. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh. I don't. I see. I, so I think that's the difference when it becomes to like. The type of performance that he does, sure, and like some of the stuff that Marina Abramovich does, because sometimes I feel like she can be totally immersed in that. You know, that's what the artist's present is about. But at the same time, it's stepping back and still having that gaze of the artist and being aware of that gaze. But sometimes I think you do. I just think as visual artists. There's like I'm I'm talking about the mining. Like sometimes you mining it, but then you're like in it, and sometimes you're coming in and out of it. And some of my videos have been like been in that sense. Um, I remember. Well, let me I'll, just get to, to Kobe's. Okay, does that oh, help? Does that, <laughs> yeah, I just see how does that uh, jive with kind of your sense of um, your work in videos. You mean like how does like masquerade and. Uh, Concealing my anonymity and concealing my identity relate to my practice. Um, well, I actually have something to say about the pop culture thing, though, too. But, sure. Um, yeah, I, I consider um, there is a shill that I gain from wearing the costuming and the masquerade and the helmets and the monitors. And I think that's just kind of like a creating... It's building a system where the viewer can identify with me as a character from my video. And I kind of constantly say I'm extending the frame of what's happening in the virtual worlds and the world building, you know, fantasy tropes that I kind of like play with in my work. And so in order to bring that into the live action realm, I feel like dressing up as or wearing the costuming that I'm wearing in the video and kind of having the spectacle and transforming the arena that I'm performing in, that's just, that's the strategy I use. And it also kind of, um, it's what, it, it, it gives me, um, it's an experiment that I'm working with to kind of just push for the mythology and the fantasy and the narrative that I'm trying to write through my own personal actions of tracing, drawing, building them, putting them in 
videos, uh, screening them in various film formats, whether it's film festivals or galleries. It's just kind of like uh, taking, it's just a strategy. It's not necessary, it's just to take, you know, the viewer away from me as the artist, but as a neutral um, body mm -hmm. that you experience in my work. And Simone, in your work, for the most part, even in the video work, um, you do not appear, is that correct? You mostly no. work with other yeah. uh, performers. Yeah. So could you yeah. talk about that displacement in terms of your role as the, as the artist, really, but it's live art, but not necessarily one in which you um, mm. make yourself directly present? Um, well, I, I, I come from a, a very religious background. My father is an evangelical preacher, and um, when I was born, we were still living in the parsonage, and I'd spent most of my childhood inside church. So I feel like that was enough in terms of me and performing. Okay. And um, <laughs> I, I really don't enjoy mm -hmm. um, being in that context anymore, so that's one of the reasons. Um, and also, I feel like I'm working in performance in a similar way that I work in sculpture, where I think about different things as being material. Like um, in your um, conversation you were saying before about interdisciplinarity and um, are we like, how are we thinking about different other kinds of what's called performing arts. Mm -hmm. um, I did a collaboration with Alicia Hallmoran and um, her, you know, sort of virtuosic control um, became a material and um, all kinds of things became a material in the work. It Just was a collaboration down. with the breakdown, yeah. which was a collaboration with Liz Magic Laser. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's just, um, so I really have been enjoying and, and hoping for more and more of that kind of like cross pollination mm -hmm. over different fields because um, it's not necessarily an engagement with, um, I don't consider it an engagement with popular culture, but an engagement with things like opera. Mm -hmm. um, and contrasting that to um, something that might be more expected coming from a black woman's body, like shouting in church or something like that, like those kinds of like thinking about those kinds of ideas, mm -hmm. um, have really been fun for me to explore. So, those are the you know that's one of the ways in which I feel like I've engaged with other disciplines. Um, well, did you want to come I, back? Yeah, because I wanted to say something too about like. Speaking of what you just said, like how an upbringing kind of shapes like how you not perform or how do you choose to conceal your body as a performance artist. And I grew up like m the basic, the, the, the general infrastructure of my practice is based around my mother's drawing practice. That influenced mm -hmm. me greatly. But I parallel that to ball culture because I'm trying to manifest her private practice into a public realm mm -hmm. in the same way that s someone in the ball scene works for a male who identifies as a mother of a house mm -hmm. and they go out and steal clothes and wear ca and participate in the label category. Acquire clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Acquire clothes. <laughs> Acquire. <laughs> Acquire. I know, it's so shady. So they do all kind of crazy stuff to like, mm -hmm. you know, perf uh, win these competitions and to perform uh, this mythology that they're building through, mm -hmm. you know, through assimilating to a European mm -hmm. kind of structure called House of Chanel, et cetera. And mm -hmm. so my mother's drawings were about assimilating to a certain kind of ma um, American material culture wealth, trying to be like the people on Dynasty. And it was mm -hmm. all about like becoming something. So in a way, my world, I'm not necessarily assimilating, but I'm querying my body through like the, the fabulous, like, you know, Afrofuturist garment and, um, just the whole aesthetic of my practice takes that and it flips it. Mm -hmm. So all those objects that are trying to assimilate to normalcy and normativity or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. I'm putting that into a high art kind of arena, taking something that she was trying to get invented and put on real Walmart markets and putting it in an alternative mar market. So that is why I use the ball kind of aesthetic as a metaphor for my practice. Mm -hmm. And because you were asking earlier about like how do you, you know, use dance or entertainment tropes in your work mm -hmm. as a way of, you know, I guess a subversive method of making art. Mm -hmm. So um, that is why I choose to present my body in the way it is. Because 
like having many costumes, there are several characters. Therefore, I'm saying I'm one of the many kids of my mother's house. Mm -hmm. So I multiply my bike. So it's like this autonomous kind of thing. So anyway, I don't know. That's that was just. There's some resonances there too, both with the way in which um, Simone you talked about working in collaboration with other artists and other disciplines, and also. Uh, Caleb, you also collaborate with other artists, but you also do this proliferation of persona, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, but actually, this wasn't one of the questions I thought of. But just hearing the, the last two responses, I, I would ask all of you: In what ways do you find your work um, in or in relation to performance about a kind of utopian, a utopian gesture, right? I mean, mm -hmm. to hear you talk about it, you're talking mm -hmm. about a space that's not really a simulation, but it's not also kind of um, uh, uh, it's also not pr private, I think was the word, you know, that you want to bring a kind of a, is that a utopian space you're looking for? Are you looking <laughs> for a utopian space in your work? I think, I, I mean, for me, I think it, it goes back uh, to something, I, I felt like we had a conversation, I think with either you or Jose about disidentification like years ago, mm -hmm. but the more I've sort of explored <laughs> myself. I think it's, it's sometimes it's about trying to reconcile the ego self and the spiritual self and, mm -hmm. and exploring that like you know it's you know who I felt I was naturally as a child but then when I grew up I had all these options to be these other things or other people and sometimes identifying with people or sometimes women on certain levels and that sort of thing so for me I think the utopia is I think to this day is almost trying to reconcile the two, but then this fear, like what happens? Do I, you know, lose myself? Like, who am I? And so I, the more I feel, I try to explore that, like more layers get pulled off or something else mm -hmm. comes up. And, you know, I tell people the day, I think the day I start making work, it's either the day I die or the day I find that place. <laughs> you know, the utopia of that peace, like where it's no longer that drive or whatever it is I'm trying to reconcile. Because I feel like I'm trying to reconcile mm -hmm. something often. And so I think it is, um, even if that's a, um, a cultural ego mm -hmm. or my own individual ego. Yeah, I just think about those moments in Romantic Loner where Kay is looking against this very sublime backdrop of the, I'm not sure where that was shot, but that's a classic image of kind of the confrontation of the limited ego by the limitlessness of nature, right? And it's, oh, when, uh, I, when I was looking at Kay? Um, what, is, was, there, there are a couple images where uh, Well, I know you, you some, some was in my apartment, and then yeah. some was out in Sausalito. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, this is the, the natural, the natural landscape, looking against the natural landscape. So the natural, that was in, in Sausalito. Yeah. I was I was trying to you know play up the romanticism okay. and the impressionism. <laughs> how, how about you, Simone? Is, because your your work, I think, some of it does point to elements of like the Afrofuturist or the utopian, and some maybe less so. Is there is there an overall sense of creating utopian space in your installations and sculptures? Well, um, Rashida Rashida Blumbre had a um, Afrofuturist survey in two thousand eight that I participated in uh, called The Future is Disruption. And um, I really realized after that show, um, looking at the works I placed in that show, and even today that I really am more dystopic. Mm -hmm. um, even though the people that know me personally, I'm like sort of outrageously optimistic mm -hmm. and forward mm -hmm. thinking, but in my work, I'm really like backward thinking or and not in, I don't mean that in any kind of um, negative sense, but I'm sort of facing history most of the sure. time. Um, so, um, you know, yeah, I, I feel like I'm just sort of, that's the direction that I've been looking in mm -hmm. for the last five years or so. Um, and I, I do have, um, feminist aspirations, but I don't know to what extent they're like manifest in the work as a, um, as a desire, you know, or, um or as a goal or anything like that. I think, um, yeah, I mean, you know, maybe through some kind of knowledge or understanding that might be, like, achieved. But I, I definitely don't feel like, um, yeah, I think I'm much more dystopic than my colleagues. 
don't even know if I'm ut- a utopic or dystopic. I think that I'm neutral. Yeah. I think that because at the end of the day, I feel like a form. I'm not a formalist at all. But when I I picture my life experience, I, I think of my life experiences as a palette of materials. And I take those materials and I figure out how to formally make beautiful images with them and deal with certain challenges in the structure and system that I built as an artist. When I'm making an animation, I'm thinking, I'm taking my painting roots and I'm thinking about well, how I do textures and space. How do I really challenge how I use space, texture, and the body as a composition tool? At the end of the day, I'm making uh, moving images that are compelling, but I my resources a very hard palette of, very, of difficult experiences in my life that are being neutralized and repurposed for something that's a lot more mysterious. And, you know, through that freedom, sometimes you'll see really negative and strange imagery that's morbid. And sometimes you'll see super happy and luscious imagery. And I feel like, you know, that's what being an artist is about. It's like just a yielding my unconscious for you to interpret who I am. And I'm figuring myself out too. And every time a writer writes about me, who's really looking at the work, they might say something about me that I didn't even know. They might find certain but, tropes that I constantly do. But I don't know. Certain I don't, obsessions. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I don't always think like when the audience is looking at, from where I, from where I mm-hmm. make my work, I don't always think they're always looking to something through the artists themselves. I think mm-hmm. when people look at work, they're often looking for themselves mm-hmm. to be, be reflected back is is why sometimes people play or pass yeah. you know because it's like if they don't identify mm-hmm. or if they they don't get something mm-hmm. then they just kind of like do you well, think that's especially true or did, did you think that that makes a difference whether or not your body is in the work like you know that does, does live art do you think audiences respond to say your performance or even a video which you're in in the same way as a work in which the artist is not present <laughs> To evoke, you know, I, I just think there. it depends on the work because mm-hmm. I know like sometimes somewhere you never know how the artists look. You know, they you know they have a certain type type of iconography sure. and a palette and a color, yeah. you know, the thing the way they execute the work and then that's what the the viewer mm-hmm. sort of you know what I mean, picks mm-hmm. up on. So I think for me, I think I trap myself because even when I try not to be in it, people like they want me in it, and mm-hmm. some people prefer my live presence. But I don't think, you know, if the artist doesn't set it up that way, mm-hmm. then it doesn't have to be that way. But I do think the audience are often looking to connect and see themselves mm-hmm. with, you know, with us, you know. But even though we're not always thinking about them but I tend to think about the audience because I think because I grew I feel like in my foundation like I grew up in the church too and I feel like that's how the whole thing was set up Mm -hmm. and I think it dates back to slavery or whatever you're trying to find the promised land and Mm -hmm. so you get to the promised land and then you realize it's all these issues and so now I think we kind of are going inward and looking through Mm -hmm. that through some type of spirituality because the reality in my from where I sit that it's always going to be when we're caught up in the ego thing one group trying to be more powerful than the other groups so I think a lot of us now are in the space where it's more uh, inward thinking but I do think the audience in terms of artists but I do think the audience is often looking to connect Mm-hmm. And we do reflect, I think ours, we do reflect back things in our work that a normal everyday person don't see unless they experience right. yeah. work, you know, yeah. art. Did you want to? Well, I was just thinking of the movie Imitation of Life. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think that I am, um, do you think of performance as an imitation of life and even referencing the movie and also things mm-hmm. like um, the cakewalk? Um, where um, there's an imitation of like um, a life you might aspire to, but there's also um, how that's being communicated or how that's even being like manifest is dependent on the knowledge of the audience. Um, mm. And I feel like that's sort of sort of the complicated terrain that Caleb is talking about, and that a lot of artists of color 
or queer artists or non-normative artists have to deal with because of that, like, you know, of not necessarily knowing the amount of knowledge or is there shared knowledge um, with the audience mm -hmm. um, about the content that might be in the work, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, this connects back to uh, the earlier discussion about, um, I guess, utopianism, not necessarily pro or con, but just in terms of world making, right? Like the audience, like who is the audience for the work? Do they understand? Are they giving whatever it is they're giving, even if it's they're giving it to a video, right? You know, but certainly if they're giving it to like a live presence in the room, um, and is that um, is that um, uh, yeah, is the mimesis of the cakewalk or the Vogue um, ball uh, culture understood as a, a creative act or as um, uh, or as, as 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 something less than creative, right? You know, as as um, um, does that. What do you mean, less than creative? Well, um, if the audience doesn't understand the um, uh, the intentions behind the work, mm -hmm. then they could see it as um, uh, simply uh, a uh, well. I'm trying not to. Use <laughs> it's like. You brought up before the conversation we were talking about David Chappelle and oh, his yeah. decision to like leave and apparently now to return to yeah, and television, said, right? Um, that he would like to be dancing and not shuffling, right? So that's what I was <clears throat> thinking about. Yeah, and who? Yeah, what audience would understand the significance of shuffling as opposed to dance and all that means? Right. Uh, yeah. Um, but it, that that actually kind of gets to a question that for. Um, again for all is and you touched upon it Caleb when you said you kind of felt trapped sometimes and in, in, in be expected to perform um, and do you other of you also find this expectation around I mean you kind of resulted <laughs> early on by not yeah. wanting to perform right but uh, but how about you Jacoby do you do you have to find yourself negotiating expectations in the art world to perform and yeah how do you how do you handle that actually I say no a lot you say no I think I, I have and I still yeah, because sometimes it gets abused, and if the person doesn't understand the context for your performance, um, it's kind of insult. I don't know. Like, yeah, it it is that thing where you feel like, am I shuffling or dancing? Yeah. And what does my body represent to you? What is the po what politic are you interested in in my work that makes you so eager for me to perform? And you know, I just got to negotiate with myself. You know, how does this function with you know the betterment of my work and my concepts? For me, I don't feel like the live body. It's the most important part of my practice. That's not where mm -hmm. my spirit lies. The live body is a sculptural extension of what I'm thinking about doing, you know, mm -hmm. with the video and the animation and the drawings and the mm -hmm. installations. But um, it's definitely not primary. So I get a lot of anxiety when people ask me to perform because I'm like, well, does this make sense for where I'm at right now? Does this add to the work? Is this going to help the video installation? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel like it's like, oh, we need a performance. It feels like a quota thing, like, okay, for me to get this funding from the Warhol Foundation, let me get that performance guy in. And it feels weird, and I don't like that. Mm. So that's how I feel. Sure, yeah, no, I mean, that's... Yeah. But if it feels like, for me, performance is like, I said this before, that it's like a, you know, it's a sketchbook. It's for, it's, it's, mm. I go around and I perform in various sites in order to gain information for what I go back to my studio to do. Mm -hmm. It is a very private, insular practice that the the purpose is super ambiguous and super ambient. No one knows why I'm like I don't have a specific end goal narrative structure or system, but I have. It's just an exploration into the world. It's like a it's like a it's almost a spiritual practice for me. Mm -hmm. It's or it's like my it's like my way of land. You know, there's the landscape painter who sets up his easel and he does his sketches and he does his like um, he does. He does his paintings. He goes back to the studio and he references them and makes you know something bigger. Like that's what Edward Hopper would do. Mm -hmm. I go out. I don't set up an easel, but I get myself filmed in various situations, and I go back in the studio and I try to kind of repurpose and revisit and relive those moments through, you know, the composition of my animated world. It's just I'm building my own conceptual formal system that will reveal itself in time as the body of work grows. But people have to understand that. And that's why I get kind of weirded out by certain curators, because I'm like, you need to understand the context and the role of the performance before you ask me to perform. Right. So. Mm -hmm. um, 
I want to shift gears slightly um, and uh, pick up what you say about yeah. the, your use of um, <laughs> performance in relation to your studio practice around animation, mm -hmm. and ask all of you about the role of technology. Um, and maybe maybe starting with you, Simone, because uh, in, in reading up on your work, I encountered a new word which I love and I'm trying to <laughs> employ and pronounce correctly, and that's skewmorphism. Yeah. Uh, the use of, um, which I understand to mean uh, the, the kind of application of kind of um, uh, obsolete or anachronistic uh, forms in new technologies. Does that help me out with the definition of skeuomorphism and, and, and where you see it in your, how it's been applied, to, I guess, to your work? Okay, so um, if a object sort of um, has to be replaced because it, a newer technology has developed, etc., um, what designers will do is leave some kind of residue or some kind of sign on the new object that reminds the audience or the user um, about the previous object so they can still be comfortable. So like a good example is that um, our digital cameras make a sound when we take a photograph, which is completely unnecessary, but it, it gives us that comfort that the photograph has been taken that we mm -hmm. had with um, previous cameras. So um, that became something that I've been thinking about a lot in sculpture, especially as it relates to some of the objects that I liked and am interested in and where a belief system is transferred from one object to the next. What is that residue or what is that like sign that's been that continues to be attached to that object so people can keep the same belief system even so even though the object has been replaced. Mm -hmm. um, Do you find so. yourself ever wanting to, to uh, tinker with that transfer? Like is that a problem that people take their belief system from one moment and kind of import it into the new moment which is supposedly more technologically progressive? But yeah, maybe, but maybe the same old ideas, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one way and then um, Another way I think about it is um, how rituals are, and you know, how things may be um, recovered or kept in secret um, because they're sort of like hidden, you know, and embodied in that object. And there's all kinds of ways to think about it, but I feel like that's a really um, significant thing to think about when you're looking at um, the 20th century and how much change happened to objects and technology in the 20th century. Um, especially as it relates to the black body. Sure. It, um, are there particular um, uh, pieces that might um, that, that come to mind of your own that come to mind that, that think about the relation between the black body and changing modes of technology or modes of representation? Um, well, I think that. Those ideas are um, definitely in the piece that I made with Chitra Ganesh. Um, our collaboration is called Girl. Um, so Girl made um, a piece that's in Radical Presence um, where there's kind of a prehistory, obviously, to the image. Um, and something must have happened that might have had to do with war or labor or work, you know, some kind of, some kind of labor. Um, or some or accident or happenstance and um, and there's a narrative that's attached to it. Um, Keiru Watanabe like created a score that creates a kind of narrative and other than that nothing really happens in the piece mm -hmm. except for there's um, a sense that there's a, a the, the thing that's interesting about the piece that's not apparent unless you see it really in projection is that the figure is breathing and so mm -hmm. it creates um that creates this kind of direct conversation with performance and idea that it's being that it's live we're talking about after um, hell is that after hell yeah. it's um it's the title comes from a gwendolyn brooks poem my oh, okay. works my dreams must um wait till after hell and and that poem is really um kind of a, she just talks about how she's so deeply involved in work that um, she's hoping that she will it will be really sweet when she's finished but right now she's just completely occupied um, in this sort of automatic process of getting the work done mm -hmm. um, and that kind of 
Ottoman, you know, like the Gutai Manifesto I was reading, and they talk about the furnace of Ottoman. Anyway, I'm getting a little off the topic, but um, that's the way in which I think um, that consideration of like, you know, a set of beliefs and how they might, anyway, that's the way in which I think I've been, that's one example of, mm-hmm. of in which I think about those ideas of school more. And Caleb, I know that um, you've been asked a lot about the role of technology in your work, and in particular, your, um, I was going to say your use, your, your relation to kind of like the lo-fi or the DIY, um, although it's interesting that over the course of your, as your career has developed, you, you actually have all kinds of sort of scalable ambitions around your work, right, that include very much uh, more, um, I guess, commercial scale technologies for media, um, but, um, but maybe starting with, the, with, the, um, with your early videos, and, and you still do use many of those, um, uh, those techniques uh, for um, uh, DIY production, uh, do you find yourself resonating with this idea that um, the, um, uh, th- there's something about technologies that are either simple or um, uh, not necessarily out of date, but, 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 but refer to a kind of older set of relationships? So I think about like the phone, for instance, mm-hmm. and uh, the phone psychic in some of your early work. You know, like there's these connections to modes of technology that are... Um, that are not the latest <laughs> cell phone, right? But nonetheless, mm-hmm. still have a kind of meaning and a and a use within the um, the world that you're inventing. Mm-hmm. Well, I think for me, because I took electronic media in mm-hmm. in graduate school, and I think it's the same thing. What she was saying about having the work relate relate back to something previous. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were in. When, we in, when I was an undergraduate, I was in film courses, and they were actually phasing out the film program to bring in electronic media. Um, most gadgets and stuff that we get are like, are sort of behind. Eight track tape. Yeah, so with the stuff that we get, you know, they, they're like, technology's like five or ten years down the road already mm-hmm. behind closed doors. Right. And so... I remember they was phasing it out, and so I started working in video instead of instead of film a lot of times because I didn't the system just wasn't set up for film anymore, and the craziest thing happened, you know, when I got into graduate school. One of the reasons why I didn't want to work with film because we had to record the audio separately, <laughs> and then all of a sudden when I got into electronic media, I sort of started recording all the, all the audio separate to add to the video later. So I thought that was an interesting thing. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I could have been doing that, but something just happened where when I started working in the video, I got sort of, sort of kind of used to that. But then I realized in terms of how I make my work, I, I max out whatever I can do (coughs) at the consumer level and what's, Mm -hmm. what's available to the consumer. Mm-hmm. So as the technology gets to a higher resolution on the consumer level, so so does my work. I see, yeah. And so what I'm doing now, because I've been able to get grants, like whenever I got a grant, I would buy and purchase the equipment. And basically, my work will probably, the way it looks, is probably based on the budget I get, you know. Like if somebody gave me a million dollar camera, then I would probably use make the most out of that million dollar camera or I make the most out of the two dollar camera and so that's kind of how I work just making the most of what you know I have and what I know at the time um, one of the reasons why I do like to teach and go into the academia system is because I can get a glimpse into what's current and so like I'm teaching now so I went up and had a meeting and so now I'm seeing the current technologies like I was like with my class you know, we're doing melodramas. I was like, well, they can make a, a melodrama out of video game, mm-hmm. but I can't because I'm not into, I'm not even into the apps and the video games. And, you know, I feel like, my gosh, I'm like such a, I'm not say old man, but I feel, but I, you know, I feel like my age. I'm like, my gosh, like, yeah. so I, I do try to check in with that, but I checked in and realized, like, mm-hmm. it's so much, other stuff going on with technology that I don't know if I would 
incorporate it into my work. Mm-hmm. Or not. You know, on my own if it's not a collaboration. And so I basically, you know, do the most I can with what's mm-hmm. available to the consumer and sometimes I can afford it with the grant or not. But I, I do own most of my equipment because I always wanted to be able to work if I got the funding or not. It's like the flip side of uh, skeuomorphism at the level of the um, technology is, is what we used to call, maybe still call planned obsolescence, right? This constant, some new, higher, faster resolution, you know, um, and, um, and that means that we're always as just consumers, but also as artists, kind of reskilling ourselves in relation. Um, I want to ask you, Jacoby, about that because you um, use uh, both uh, CGI graphics and um, also motion capture. Um, so you're at the cutting edge of, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and 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 you. I mean, particularly with motion capture, there mm-hmm. seems to be a lot of connections, obviously, with movement and gesture, right? Mm-hmm. To um, uh, to to the latest technologies. But what what, what role does uh, technology play in uh, in the unfolding of your unconscious as you, you know, I mean, in, in, in yeah. terms of in terms of your practice. Well, the reason why technology entered, or like such a advanced technology entered my work, was because after I abandoned painting and I was doing mostly really strict performance with a cheap point and shoot camera, I just got depressed because I was longing to touch the work and it was like after it was filmed I wasn't touching anything anymore and I needed some kind of tactility and some kind of process in it and uh, so I started experimenting with you know very bad animations around live action performances I did in Skowhegan and I started to discover that a lot of drawing and tracing and what they call rotoscoping could enter my work and I and, and as I learned those processes I realized um I could actually trace and build my mom's drawings and use objects as performance scores for my work and then also create that like painterly landscape that I've been longing to generate. So through with having a goal, it made me want to learn more and more and more about the medium. And there was, you know, you can't it, you can't generate passion without a very serious, you know, goal and structure. So the role that it plays is just that desire to uh to make a certain kind of image and imitate a certain kind of process that I love, which is painting. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's why. That's what. That's why. That's why I work in the way that I do because, mm-hmm. you know, as an artist. When I was a baby, I loved art because it was something you can touch. I love tactility. I love the analog. I mm-hmm. say my practice is a paradox because it's advanced technology that seems automatic, but my way of making my work, there isn't no motion capturing really. I'm trying to get to that point, mm-hmm. I'm trying to use a connect right now, but when I attach objects to my body, I spend a whole week tracing the hand frame by hand. Mm. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, because okay. I'm not wearing a glove, there's no you, way you You can. are the motion capture. <laughs> yeah, I am. Okay. So I put a locator on the hand, okay. it's, so yeah. it's so tactile, it's so yeah. much touch, it's so much meditation. There's so many albums I'm listening to. There's just a trance. It's right. a very like, it's almost a spiritual practice making. That's why I say I get lost in the formal parts. My mm-hmm. palette is the world, and I bring it into this one. When I'm mm-hmm. making an animation, it is not about anything but like putting together this stuff that came from other loaded things. But mm-hmm. anyway, that's why the, the technology is just a pursuit to paint. Sure. Yeah. Um, but that is a, that is a really interesting answer because I think most people probably looking at. Um, at the video work would have maybe drawn an analogy either to to, to, to movies or to video game, right? You know, but gaming the, the actually, I keep forgetting to say, yeah. But I I I play. I was a gamer from age three to sixteen, and I mean a serious gamer. I had five hundred magazines, EGM Gaming Monthly, Game Pro. I would play every role playing game, Tekken, every, mm-hmm. Metal Gear Solid, Zelda, Mario sixty four, every game. I was I had no real life I didn't leave the house I have to wear these glasses because I have they run my eyes so that's the aesthetic that I am also influenced by so there is a like postmodern intersection of like painting history mm-hmm. and gaming history and music video history like I take all those in- histories and intersect them queer history um, mm-hmm. you know like gaming does have a major role of influencing the way my world looks 
and there's an interesting kind of despite the the, the, the differences in your practice there seems that there's a there's a there's a comparison perhaps between um Caleb, what you said earlier about the importance of kind of having your technology so that you can work it right so that whatever you get however high tech it is it's something that you can yourself kind of control and and manipulate and so there's a tactility and then and a, and a an embody if not spirit you know in spiritual practice to 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 make to the use of the technology the ghost in the machine um so um kind of as a final uh, uh question uh, to the panel and thank you all for your um uh really uh exciting interesting responses um but we're in the hot topic section of the of the uh, round table now <laughs> and uh, so i want to ask you uh the question on everyone's lips which is what do you think about this new uh trend towards exhibiting and collecting performance alongside uh, painting and sculpture um, and other more traditional arts, even like video. Um, you know, many people see this as the next step or evolution for performance art. Um, others, you know, wonder what goes missing when something gets placed um, in a in a kind of institutional setting. So, what are your thoughts about? about that? Oh, I think like. Um you know, I think performance can be collected. I think it depends on how the artist kind of wish it to yeah. be executed if they're not in the presence or if they're dead afterwards. Because um, sometimes some things are highly conceptual that it's, you know, it's like when someone writes a song, Another singer can comes along, come along and perform it. So mm -hmm. it'll, it'll be slightly different. It just depends on if you need the energy or the body. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody wanted me there to perform it, then okay, then it's not going to be. But it doesn't mean someone else couldn't. You know, it's like when I write a song. I mean, I just did this thing at Fire Island. Did this residency where we did karaoke mm -hmm. and then I gave the the guys that were doing karaoke, I gave them Taiwan's clothes and so they put on Taiwan clothes and did mm -hmm. karaoke as Taiwan but it was them mm -hmm. and not me. I, so I think it'll either be another layer or mm -hmm. it won't be the same as me doing it but if the idea of the work is bigger than just me. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's yeah. interesting as a response because, you know, getting right into this kind of, uh, this notion of re-performance re and, and, and that performance can be a kind of like a gift to the world that can endure beyond the uh, individual acts or actions of the artist. Um, but that's also the example you gave, I mean, if I understand it correctly, is one in which the work is now circulating quite freely, mm -hmm. you know, amongst people who chose to receive that gift, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, how does that compare then, though, to to the institutional collecting of performance? Right. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's, it's related, but, but it could be slightly different, right? Where I th yeah, I performance think, because something that is owned. Well, it, it depends by, on what medium they collect it in. Yeah. Like you know, like if it's collected as it needs to be reperformed live, then you just write out the descriptions and, and that right. sort of thing. Um, I do like the fact that when institutions collect my work, that they can preserve certain aspects of my work. Mm -hmm. I guess until, I mean, we say the internet is going to be around <laughs> forever, but we don't know because it could change form the the same way television, mm -hmm. you know, something else could come along, yeah, that we don't see right now that could take the place of internet. I mean, I don't know, but I do, I do like, you know, like not everyone likes that whole historical context thing, but I sort of like it because I if it's nothing but a reference point mm -hmm. to have my work you know collected by the, by institution if it's by individuals then it's up to those collectors of like how they present it like I find that my work are pre is presented at parties mm -hmm. so people it's like a social thing but in an institution or a school it can be also an educational thing but Educational can be social at the same time. I feel, you know, I feel like, you know, the art world is this whole social 
discourse type of setting. And so I like my work being in that, but I know some artists don't always like that aspect. It, you know, they've just been in the now, now, now. But there's a certain mode of attention, perhaps, that people want their work to be given that you don't get in that. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah, what, do, what do people think about the, the collecting of performance? Um. Well, I I just think it it um I agree with Caleb. It really depends on the desire of the artist. Some um, are like more of a soloist type, and some are not. But I also think about ethnographies and a lot of. Um, um, you know, I just, I, I think about how grateful I am for some of the uh, performances that have been captured even in very problematic ways mm -hmm. um, and under not the best in circumstances from like West African Masquerade to like Divine Horseman, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Maya Derriman. It's like, you know, all that and you know, and I think about how grateful I am even for the problematics and being able to really look and have a document that really spells out, um, you know, what went down. And, and, and so I, um, I have a lot of gratitude even for the things that maybe shouldn't have been captured mm -hmm. um, or remembered or, or put into the archive. Um, so, yeah, I have a lot of complicated opinion, feelings about it. My opinion about it is, well, because you can buy a performance video, a performance photograph, but when you're like signing certificate of authenticity of an invisible act, I think that is interesting. I mean, I can I, like the, the soloit structure is great. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of like the instructions for a drawing, and that is actually that's very intentional. But if you're putting all performance artists under that kind of like theory when that's not the intention of the performance artist is kind of weird like if someone asked to buy the performance that I did at four I'd be like well that's weird mm -hmm. I don't know because it's not I didn't see it as I don't even know how I see that piece but um I'm not quite sure when people buy my videos um they because that is a relic of a very long-winded five-month performance it's really a durational performance because I performed for weeks in a green screen and trace the bodies for weeks and then put things around them digitally. I mean, it's a, a, a new genre, a new media performance piece, a digital performance piece, which a lot of people will not want to consider that. But I feel it's just weird. It depends on how you sell it. Like, I'm very freaked out by it, actually. I mean, I can see... Yeah, yeah, because then performance is preserved on the internet now. People document it and put it on websites, on YouTube. Um, like, what it feels kind of just a historical obligation or an institutional, it feels like a formal obligation of an institution to continue the tradition of acquisitions and mm -hmm. advance them. It just feels like a gesture more than a reality. It doesn't feel necessarily real to me. I want to, do you want to pick up on that? Oh, no, I was going to say, I do, I do, but I feel they, I just think it's a difference in, in viewing the documentation of something and then actually experiencing, experiencing that performance. Well, that was, I was going to ask, right, life. is there something about, still, despite the mediation and all the technology and documentation, is there still something about witnessing or participating or making a performance that will always um, uh, evade any kind of collection or preservation what do you mean evade like like we'll just go missing like you had to be there yeah i do because i also because i feel i feel like when they did marina show at the moment who at moment does collect performances that they had a lot of people re reenact a lot of her performances and people were saying things were missing but often when i do performances like i always tell them you can record it if you want to you can document it if you want to, because like once I get up there and I do it and I'm gone, then I'm not worried about it, because I spend my time making the video, videos for that purpose. But if someone wants, when they document me, like I just don't care after, because and if somebody wants to cover the song, to cover the performances, they can. I already accepted that it's going to be a different 
experience than having me because my work often evolves. It does evolve out of an emotion that's real for me in that moment. And sometimes I have to go back when I'm performing songs that sort of conjure up mm -hmm. some emotion just to get back into that space to make the song feels real, but I often just do it and move on. But I mean, let's think about internet, like lo-fi internet trends on YouTube, like planking or that weird, awful one, like the Trayvon thing where everyone was like, photographing themselves with Skittles and a Pepsi can with a hoodie on on the ground dead. And that's just a performance gesture. It's lo-fi, it's low-brow, it's kind of like empty. But they become extremely viral and millions of people mimic the same gesture and it's kind of preserved through this viral digital data that gets unavoidably archived. But I'm, say but I'm saying it's the difference between like with performance, mm -hmm. sometimes you watch it from the screen, but sometimes you want to be in that same space oh, is yeah, what I'm yeah, talking yeah. about. No, but you I'm, can be in the same space like as the person when they do it. I guess what I'm saying is... I'm not talking about on the screen. I'm like, saying like we're sitting here and then somebody come react. Yeah, that's what I'm your, saying. One of your performances. So I think that part, I think it gets complicated unless somebody can conjure up my spirit from the grave. Yeah. And then I, you know, I join in with them. So that's the part I'm talking about. But I think in terms of... The documentation. Some artists do create performances and have want them to be viewed as documentation. But when I perform live, then I like for people to be in the space to feel that that interaction right then and there. Um, or then they could just go watch all my children on the, <laughs> <We somehow laughs> the managed, Young and the Mess. <laughs> we managed to uh, open up a can of worms right at the end of our time. <laughs> but we're going to leave our viewers with this question of the live versus, you know, the mediated and uh, the viral versus, you know, um, you have to be there. Or a conversation um, with the grave. And uh, <laughs> conversation well, from the grave. That's my well, see, I when you about the voodoo, I was thinking about like the yeah. Holy Ghost and stuff like that's that right. in church. And then, because I've been that's watching right. those videos on YouTube, and they seem so similar. Which they one? really you know do. I mean? It's very Holy, the Holy Ghost and the voodoo, like how the spirit there. moves through yeah. the church. So I was interested in when she brought that up. So, well, thank you all thank you. Um, for uh, taking some time to talk with us this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very welcome. much. Cool.